First of all, welcome to Startup Night Barcelona. This is our event number 100 plus. We lost count. We had our event number 100 in, with one of Javi's actually co-founders, Avi Mayer, in September. Um, and of course, maybe thanks to the pandemic, quote, quote, we, we accelerated the number of events we're doing. We're doing them online now. I know you all miss our offline events. We all miss you. We miss seeing people. But safety first, people over business. That's what we believe at Startup Prime. That's, and that's how we roll here. We want to take it easy and come back better and stronger. So I know that it will be a year since our last physical event. Um, but anyways, whenever possible, with all the safety measures and everything, we'll be back. Startup Prime Barcelona is part of Startup Prime. What we do is foster entrepreneurship in every goddamn city and country in the world. We're over, I think, 700 cities already in over 135 different countries. We are literally and virtually everywhere. What we do is connect, um, inspire, and educate entrepreneurs worldwide. And we are in a huge partnership with AWS uh, for startups right now, which are, happen to be the main sponsors. So big thanks to them. Without further ado, we want to introduce our speakers for tonight because this topic is really important. Like it was important before the pandemic. It's even more so important now that, you know, the effects of work derived mental issues have increased, have doubled, have, I don't know, have increased significantly. I don't know if not doubled is the exact number, but people are suffering more because if they were suffering before, now they're suffering at home, they're suffering alone, and they're suffering from all of these other, uh, you know, stress related to family, related to not seeing friends, related to losing people they love and everything, right? So, Nasi, I think you want to, well, first of all, welcome to, uh, welcome Nasi, one of our uh, team members at Star Prime Barcelona. You want to introduce one of our speakers for tonight. I'll do the other, right? All yours. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So I have the, the pleasure, the honor to introduce uh, Sanchar Shahin, um, who was previously, uh, who was previously the VP of Marketing at uh, Hotjar, and before that, um, VP of Marketing at Platform, where um, I met you, where I met him, um, I was in, in his team, and uh, always amazed by his ability to find the perfect analogy for just any situation. Um, yeah, like uh, Sancho is coming from a, and this is something I've always found interesting, but you're not coming from a, a classical business administration marketer, profile background, but more like from the film, radio, media landscape, and I think that's, um, that always contributes to something uh, special in a in a person to bring like different perspectives on board. So yeah, very happy to uh, to have you here, Sancho. Thanks for thanks for coming. Thank you, Nasser. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, great intro and um, nice to see you again. And the the other speaker, you know him already, although he looks a little bit different from the last time we saw him at Star Brand Barcelona. First time we hosted Javi, uh, he's mostly well known for being one of the co-founders of Travel Perk. And back then, uh, it was, if I remember correctly, it was January 2018, uh, you guys were booming, like you were going like off the, 2019, sorry, you were going through the roof. And uh, before that, you had been at uh, booking.com. You're the kind of like crazy guy who gives uh, business plans to other, to your friends for his birthdays or travels, uh, your, <laughs> I mean, he traveled his ass off from, I think it was Argentina to Barcelona to make, this company happened, well, the, the previous company. So as like a real passionate entrepreneur, now he's also investing. Um, and it looks like you're gonna be a serial entrepreneur because uh, from the, the companies you got created in the past and now what you're creating now, I think we need to hear from you guys, from the two of you, uh, what is all about? Because it's literally the first time we interview somebody with a new venture, not a lot of people are sort of. Usually we interview people with companies over a hundred employees, or more than 10 million in annual revenue, right? So this is quite the exception, but we really wanted to talk about this topic. So, well, first, welcome to Start Brand. And Kavi, maybe you wanna start by describing what is Oliver. Thanks so much for the kind intro as well. Yeah, pleasure. So look, um, I'll just backtrack how the whole idea happened. And, and basically what happened was, I was building travel for my previous company and it was a really intense ride, right? As you might imagine, we were growing like crazy and, and a lot happening at the same time. So there was a few points in that, in that trajectory that I just really wanted some help. Like I was noticing I was getting anxious, I was getting the imposter syndrome. And um, so I tried, I tried a few times. I went online, I tried to put therapists in Barcelona, therapist in Berlin, therapist in London. And, um, and it was incredibly hard. Basically you go online and you have hundreds of websites 
with like clinical jargon. You have no idea what you have. You have, doing, you have no idea what you need. Um, and you're pretty much left alone. And that, so I eventually found somebody and, and it worked out. It took me a few tries. Uh, I must say that every time I tried to find help and it didn't work out and it didn't work out basically because the connection with the therapist was simply not there. And the idea of having to start again the whole process it was just mind blowing to me in terms of the energy required, because it's such an such a, a um, how do you say it? it's an outdated space, right? And you have to call the phone, you have to do an appointment, you have no idea what's going to happen, you probably have to pay in cash, and the whole thing takes a lot of energy. So that kind of left me thinking: uh, if I'm having this problem as the founder of the company, can you imagine everybody else in my company what they're going through? Right? It's it's the same problem, and and of course, on top of that, you have the whole thing that you don't know how open you should be about this. Right? There's a huge stigma attached to it, and especially from a founder perspective as well. Right? But from an employee perspective, even more probably. Right? Because you have this fear that what if I open up, what, what, am I gonna get the promotion? How are they gonna see me? Are they gonna kick me out? Where should I go? Uh, maybe I don't have the, res the financial resources to get help, uh, but I need my job. So it's kind of like becomes a chicken and an egg situation. And, and that just really stayed in my mind, right? It's, it's 2020, we're talking about having flying taxis in Barcelona in a few years, but finding a damn psychologist, it's really, really hard. And um, so it really stayed in my mind. And after I left Travel Perk, uh, I had more time, obviously. So I started interviewing a bunch of therapists. And these therapists, because uh, I, I knew the problem from my side, but I didn't know the problem from the therapist side. Why, why is it so outdated and opaque and clinical, right? And um, so I started interviewing like about 100 therapists around the world. And it basically came down to this conclusion. I mean, these people, they go to university, depending on where they get accredited, for four to six years, right? And the moment they graduate, they're expected in 95% of the cases, you know, if they don't go to a hospital or a clinic, they're expected to open a business the next day, which is basically their practice. But to open this practice, you have to have a website, you have to do marketing, you have to do accounting, et cetera, et cetera. And then it became really clear to me the reason why the market is so fragmented and outdated is because we have a bunch of therapists that were never trained for business running a business. They don't want to run a business, but they're doing it because they have to, right? And um, so, so then it became clear the problem is on both sides, right? And, and that's kind of like where the whole spark happened. It's like, what if you could create, what if you could create like a consumer brand for mental health? Like, you know, you, if you go to physical health, there's hundreds of brands, luxury brands, low cost brands, medium brands, super well done. But when it comes to mental health, it's completely clinical. So what if we create a, a modern consumer brand for consumers and for businesses where it's very easy for these three different personas, you have you know, just an individual, you have employers, and then you have the practitioners. What if you remove the whole noise build infrastructure for this to become really accessible and easy and for these people to either focus on getting help or giving help but that doesn't really exist right there's a few versions of it which we're happy to go on into it uh, uh, later but the but the overall idea is just create a consumer modern brand slash experience where mental health is just very easily accessible from one stand and hopefully through the brand you can also reduce the stigma that needs to be killed as soon as possible, right? And, and that's Oliva. Oliva, the first starting point of what we're doing is, is meaningful therapy for busy people. And, and basically the title describes what we do is we just make it very easy for busy individuals. And, and to be clear, busy could mean a mother, a professional, in any person that has limited time and don't wanna spend hours and hours Googling how they should access help, they should come to Oliva. Because all you have to do is literally, you have to show up, make an appointment, and you don't have to pick your therapist, think what you need, with the risk of getting it wrong, obviously. You first come to us and you say, hey guys, I think I need help. I'm not sure what I need, but this is what I'm feeling. And we basically do uh, an in-depth survey uh, uh, before to get a bit of attributes on how you're feeling, right? So in terms of anxiety, in terms of depression, in terms of habits. With that data, 
then we do a matching session where we bring this client with the, with the clinical psychologist and we go deep into these points just to really truly understand what is the issue and what do they need. And once that's very clear, we create a report for these two individuals, for the customer and for the assigned therapist. Because now we have all this data and also on the other side, we know exactly what is the length of experience from a therapy side for each pathology, for each, uh, each issue type. And therefore we're able to do a meaningful uh, match um, you know, among these two individuals. On top of that though, we believe, hey, what happens if we get it wrong? And, and a big part of the anxiety that people have is, I have limited budgets, limited time. I don't have the time nor the money to do this several, to try several times. So what we say is, hey, come to our matching session. We'll match you with the therapist. If we get it wrong for whatever reason, we take you back to the matching session. We go in depth, what went wrong, and we rematch you with a new therapist. And you get those two sessions that you already did where we got it wrong, you got them back for free. And believe it or not, so far within all the customers that we have, not one has wanted to change. But I think just the idea or just the psychology behind it that you're able to without a cost to you just already removes a lot of that anxiety. And I'll stop there because I can keep going forever. <laughs> we know you, Javi. We know you. We, we, we know your sales oriented. <laughs> no, it's really good. Today. It's really good. We need to have the perspective. So thank you for it. That's what we do today. And, and that's kind of like step number one. We do envision to become a platform with different verticals, right? Uh, you have psychology, you have psychiatry and so forth. Uh, but the, the big, big vision is that if you have a friend or you yourself need some kind of mental support, you should not think how and when and if. Just go to Oliva. It's super easy. Don't think about it. And we'll take care of you. And we'll get you in the right path. I would say that. But I'm going to leave Sanj jump in because maybe I'm missing something. And you will have to give a discount count or something to compensate for the, the, the longest speech we've ever had at Star Brand Wars. <laughs> 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 my bad, my bad. Yeah, that was no, that was really um, interesting for sure. Like, yeah, so sure. We're also going to to ask you what um, what, how your path was. Like, what did you have an aha moment when you realized the importance of the of the issue? Was it like what made you realize and what was your kind of thought process? And then also, how did that lead you um, end up in in Oliva and end up with uh, end up with Javi? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, um, so Javi brought the problem to me. He mentioned the problem. And I immediately connected with it. And the reason I immediately connected with it is because I too uh, had gone through a similar path. So I've been working in the startup environment for, for some time now uh, here in Spain. And um, so, for example, when I started at Typeform, I was quite an early employee. We were a small company and then we became a very big company uh, very, very quickly. Nasir, you might remember some of this, uh, some of these anecdotes yourself. Um, and that comes, that's, that's an amazing experience, probably better than any uh, university degree could ever give me. Um, but it definitely came with its pressures. And quite honestly, uh, at the beginning of me starting a Typeform, when I think back, I didn't know anything. Um, and what I th when I think about what I knew when I left and what, it, what the kind of cost of learning that quickly was, the cost was an emotional cost. So it was uh, hard. So I did go through, um, you know, some hard times. I did uh, experience professional burnout myself. So I too uh, sought the help of a therapist. Uh, I didn't see it as a big thing at the time. I thought, okay, let's let's talk about this. You know, it seems like the right thing to do. And I'll walk you through my experience. So I, so I, I did the exact same thing that Javi just mentioned. So I Googled, I saw all of those horrible websites, but I fought through it. You know, I'm a marketer. I've seen horrible websites before. Um, I found a therapist, uh, good, good price, et cetera, et cetera. I went to them and so this was uh, physical, this was therapy in a physical space. And I walk into the waiting room and there's a receptionist um, dealing with lots of payment issues with a queue of about six people, each trying to pay by card or somebody paying by cash and things like this. And somebody else trying to sort out their next session, you know, all with one person, it seems very chaotic. Uh, I sit down in front of all of this and I look at the generic pictures around me and the generic magazines. And then I started to notice I can hear something. And what I could hear was, the therapy sessions going on behind the closed doors. Um, I could actually hear the conversations that were happening behind closed doors. And there's a very simple reason for that. That's because the space had not been designed to provide therapy. It had just, it's just a space that somebody put a therapy practice in. And it was then when I realized that there's no design around this. People aren't designing an experience around a very important activity. 
Um, and look, I, I kind of carried on. I went, but I was always on, on guard. I always kept my voice down, you know, thinking somebody else was listening uh, to me. I, I never felt like I could properly let go. And that straight away meant that I had a lesser experience in terms of the therapy. So quite honestly, I, you know, I put it behind me. As, I didn't really think too much more about it. I just put it down to another kind of uh, experience that isn't really designed around uh, in the way that it should be. But then when Javi mentioned to me what he just said um, very eloquently just now in his sales pitch, pitch um, when he told me that, um, I just click, it, it clicked for me straight away. You know, this is clear. This wasn't just an isolated experience for me uh, seeking uh, help from a therapist. This is a problem that uh, is much bigger than that. And, and, and it means there's a huge problem to be solved. So, so um, yeah, we connected straight away on the problem. Uh, we connected straight away on the vision and we connected uh, straight away in terms of what complementary skills we could bring to the table as well to actually to make it happen. Circling back to what Javi said, he had a really good point, right? Is that, you know, therapies, if you Google, there's literally no value proposition. They all look the same, right? Maybe one has got a better website. The other one maybe is cheaper, whatever. But therapies are kind of like dentists. They're kind of also like, like a repairman and everything that you go to them through recommendation. You literally just don't Google. Like, like mostly you will ask your friends first, like you go to a therapist or something like that, or maybe not because this is a taboo, maybe not in the business world, but at least, you know, if I want to, you want, I want to change dentist, I will ask my friends. If I want to take my car to be repaired, I will just not Google that kind of things. I will just ask my friends because it's something that you build with trust. And you know that these people, they're really good at what they do, but they're not good at marketing themselves, right? So most likely their websites are not good. They're not even on Google. Their phone is wrong. The information is outdated, whatever, right? So are you actually like, you know, the pandemic also helped to sort of accelerate their presence on the internet because before that they were like, ah, yeah, whatever. You can just walk in into the, into the, into the clinic or whatever. But like right now, no, right now you need to have a website. You need to be advertising yourself on social media or at least have a sort of, you know, the Facebook slash WhatsApp, um, con customer support, things like that. So do you see that this, like, this is happening, this is happening as sort of the digital transformation in this, in this uh, sector or still word of mouth, it's still going to be for therapy. Just what's, what's your take on it, Kavi? Like, is, is it, people talk about, they recommend therapists or they keep it as something private, it's a taboo, I don't want to recommend it to friends because I don't want them to know that I go to one. So yeah, it's a great point. Look, um, the problem is that there's a huge difference between recommending a dentist and a therapist because the dentist, it, you know, it can be, it, it's, it's a bit more generic, I would say. When it comes to therapy, your issue and what works for you doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for the issue and for the personality of your friend. So in many, many cases, these, re these uh, uh, referrals get it wrong, right? And, and, and I think that's the first part that's a bit dangerous about recommending a therapist to a friend is that you really don't know if that's the best match for them. So, so that's exactly what we're trying to eliminate. You not having to say, hey, go to Julia or Peter, my therapist, is you just say, go to Oliva, because I don't have to tell you a name, they'll find the best one for you, right? Uh, nevertheless, coming back to the stigma point, there's definitely stigma, right? And only the brave, uh, uh, regardless of business, business even more, but also from a personal perspective, in many cases, people are afraid of opening up and, and asking this stuff, right? So, so if you don't have that courage, and you have to go online, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. It's a big problem and it's very complex. And I do agree with what you said that is accelerated uh, the transition from offline to online. A lot more people that were before completely uh, against doing a, a, an online have now had to do online and they've noticed, hey, this actually works, right? Uh, uh, so, um, so that's definitely been the positive side from, from COVID, I guess, that people are accepting and are willing to at least try online. Um, um, but yeah. You're mute, Nazia. This is, yeah, this is the code of 2020. <laughs> those five seconds when you're looking for the, for the button. Um, I wanted to go back to something that both of you mentioned, um, because both of you in your own experiences when looking for therapy observed all of those um, like flaws in the in the experience, the, the the processes were not optimized. You had to wait in the queue. The the space was not designed to have therapy. So I was wondering, 
did those factors and those observations already drive you to the conclusion that um, you want to take this online? Or how, how to, to what extent did COVID play a role in it? And did the timelines of um, COVID developing and uh, you thinking about the product overlap to kind of take that into consideration as well, thinking, so not only could it be um, coordinated and managed and optimized better online, but now on top of that, we also see the pandemic um, happening or did uh, what you just mentioned happen like even before um, COVID happened? How were the timelines and the influences? Great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I can quickly comment on that. So, so actually when we um, started off, we uh, talked a lot about the offline side of therapy a lot. And from the beginning, offline was very much within our vision and it still is to be completely frank. Um, to answer your question directly, COVID was definitely a big contributor for us starting with um, online and focusing on that first. I mean, it just makes sense. I mean, to to kind of roll out offline, um, you know, in the middle of a global pandemic just didn't make any any sense. That said, we, we see a lot of value in offline. So I don't think it's a matter of offline or online or, you know, online is something you do just while you can't access the offline experience. But there's definitely something to be said for, for example, starting off your therapy course um, offline. So you can kind of establish that relationship a little bit quicker with your therapist and then easily transitioning to the online. Or for some people, they just prefer to do it completely online or they prefer to do it completely offline. You know, all sorts of people uh, prefer different things. There's also a much more kind of nuanced reason to, to want to do it offline, which is, um, for example, a lot of people in cities uh, live in small apartments like I do. I live in a tiny little apartment in, in Barcelona. Um, and for me to sit there and do therapy, is going to be like doing therapy back in that uh, clinic that I mentioned before. You know, my you know, my girlfriend plus my six neighbors are going to hear what I'm saying. So it's not exactly going to be a, a private experience. So imagine if there was a little offline space that I could go to to speak to somebody in person or even um, do therapy, but but um, online. So offline is very much within our vision. We we think there's a huge amount of value there. Um, maybe not exactly as we know it today. I think there are a lot of ways to improve the offline experience, some of the obvious ones and some not so obvious ones. Um, but yeah, right now to go fully into the offline experience, you know, in the middle of the current situation that we're in just didn't make a lot of sense. But there's not a day that goes by where we're not thinking bigger than than online. Let's talk about let's let's open up. I think that's the that's the moment we, we know already uh, what your company does, what what is your vision? We're going to send more information to our participants in our community because I'm pretty sure that this is something that outside of marketing, this is something that needs to be widely distributed. Uh, people are in need of help. We've seen it in ourselves. We've seen it in our employees. We've seen it in other companies and in our friends and colleagues. So let's let's talk about it. Um, we, not even a month ago, we had um, Carlos Pierre from Badi, right? And I had interviewed him a couple of years back and we had a really long winded conversation about imposter syndrome, right? Because we thought we both shared on stage for almost half an hour that we thought we were not the right CEOs for our companies. And this is one of the work derived issues that I wanted to talk about today. Is that something uh, maybe you have any experience in, in Travel Perk or not? I mean, you, I think you sort of mentioned it, but also you had uh, burnout. You, you experienced a few things. What were the which was the one that came to mind first, or the one that you you know you detected first, and the one you spoke about first too, right? Which is the one that you shared, and maybe some others you didn't want to share because you didn't want to um, you know make available or make it public your vulnerability, maybe. And so, which which ones were they, and how did you deal with them? It's a great question. Um, I was actually scared shitless. I didn't tell anybody. I um, I had no idea how to go around it. I had no idea how you know investors were going to perceive it. My how the teams were going to perceive it. It was really tough, man. Uh, uh, having to do this on my own at night at home, uh, hiding this the whole time. Uh, it was horrible, honestly. And and I wish I would have opened up. And 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 because I'm sure that other people were in the same box. For me, it was it was I would say a combination between anxiety and imposter syndrome for sure maybe anxiety a bit more and um and i just knew that i had to get get help uh, i tried several times until i finally kind of found help uh, you know after after maybe a year and a half of trying 
Um, so I, I, that was definitely too late. I wish I would have found help a lot sooner. Um, but it was, it was, it was not nice. It was not nice. And it just really marked, it, it really left a mark in me. And, and I thought, Hey, you know, if I ever, ever start a company, because back then I thought I'm never going to do this shit again. I'm never going to do a tech startup again. This is it. This is too much. This a lot of entrepreneurs much. say that, and you know, it's kind of like a drug. You just, and resorting back to it. But I said, if I do it, then I'm going to solve this problem. It's just, it's just too much in my face. Right. And um, so, yeah, I never really found the exact solution that I envisioned for myself. Right. It was a lot of trial and error uh, of different methods, therapy, and, you know, a bit of sport that didn't work. I tried meditation, didn't work as well. I was, I think probably, to be honest, I pushed it back so much that by the moment that I really needed help, it was probably a bit too late. Like I should have definitely gotten on that wagon way before and prevent a bit more than react, right? Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it. But how about the opening up part? Because, you know, <laughs> nowadays I, I think like leaders nowadays, even more so because of the pandemic, right? Um, are okay with opening up about this kind of things. Whereas five years ago, 10 years ago, not to mention 50 years ago, a leader couldn't show fragility, right? Or vulnerability. It was like strong, determined, like super, you know, no, you know, no weakness in the leader. If you were perceived as weak, you're not a good leader. Whereas nowadays, I think that this leadership through empathy and even open feelings, it's becoming a thing. I'll share you an example. Like uh, at the, I think it was May when I was, I was kind of like, I was down. I, I was, I was down just because of the, of the pandemic situation. Right. And I had my moments of doubt as a CEO of my company. And I, I kind of like broke it down to my employees. I shared a, a private post on Basecamp saying like, look, I think I failed you as a CEO. I think like where, because we weren't selling uh, projects for, for a while because of the pandemic, Not, nobody was buying shit. Right. And so like, maybe we, this company deserves another kind of CEO and this is how I'm feeling. And that in itself was good therapy. Like I thought it was a risky move. It could go really well. It could go, I mean, I didn't think about whether it could go one uh, right or left, right? But it could go really wrong. And it ended up being self reassuring because you know the, the, the message back from the employees was more than positive. And that made me feel like, wow, maybe I just overreacted or something, but I needed to get it off my chest, right? And I think that the reaction I got from most of them is like, thank you for creating an environment where these things can, can be talked about. And now we're more open in the company uh, to do so. Have you experienced something like that at Travel Perk? Or how do you think the new leaders and this, the new world we're starting now will behave from now on? So um, I definitely felt like that at Travel Perk. I, um, but I didn't, I didn't have the courage to do what you did. I, I kept it for myself until the last day. Uh, it's actually now the first time that I voice it, to be quite frank. Uh, um, but I think that uh, luckily one positive thing uh, that has kind of like just put it in the face of everybody is this pandemic is like, hey, you know, before people might have thought, leaders might have thought, hey, maybe I have some mental health issues in the company, but, but it's all good. It's all under control. And now things are just really popping up. Right. Like literally people are seeing how employees are falling down uh, um, and, and need mental support. If I yesterday read a survey from from PricewaterCoopers and in the in the US, 70 per, 76 percent of all the companies they surveyed have made mental health a top priority. Right. And, and that for me is massive. That illustrates really the importance that it's becoming. I think it's the, the beginning of a real movement. Uh, uh, Nevertheless, I do think still that we have a road ahead in terms of stigma, right? It's one thing is to say we make it a priority and another thing is to train the entire organization and to really instill it in your values and actually live those values. And I believe what you did, Alex, is exactly that. It's like, hey, I'm feeling shit, I'm not sure this. And just by doing that, you're creating almost a value, right? You can say these things, we're open, right? And so I think that um, people are, are starting to learn that, that it's just a fact, right? If you think about it, uh, uh, um, 
you have one out of every five people has a mental health issue. So that means that just by looking in your office, you know one of every five has it. And by not addressing it, you're losing a lot more uh, from an economical standpoint and also from a culture perspective than addressing it. And I think that's kind of like the realization that people are doing is like, hey, the problem is here. We might as, we might as well attack it before it becomes, instead of just one out of five, two or three out of five, which this pandemic has brought forward. So, um, so I think things are going in the right direction, uh, uh, but I still think it's very early days in this movement. But I think, you know, if I could just chime in there, Alex, what you were saying as well, that, that trend that you've observed in, in leadership where people, you know, can feel like they can be more authentic in a way, that's essentially, I think, people starting to realize that you don't have to put on this fictional character to be in a manager, you know, managerial or a leadership position. And I think that's something that was definitely the case for for a long time. You know, if you if you think back to the 80s office, for example, and the idea of what a manager looked like back then and how they acted, you had to kind of put on this persona. And I think people starting to realize, well, actually, that's not what endears people to people. You know, if you think about when you meet a new person uh, at a party or something, who do you warm to the most? Is it the person who's talking about themselves the whole time, uh, saying how brilliant they are? you know, saying how successful they are, how much money they have and how perfect they are? Or is it the person who has a hint of vulnerability, who uh, who has, you know, um, some authenticity about them? And, you know, let's be honest, to be authentic is definitely to be imperfect. There's no perfect people out there. So so I think people are starting to wake up to um, authenticity and leadership. Uh, and I think this is also a trend that's being brought, th- brought forward by brands as well. You know, brands are definitely... Um, I think, you know, consumers are demanding this more, which is why these movements are happening from brands, but brands are adding a lot more authenticity into their, into their marketing. Um, So yeah, I think it is happening internally, but as Javi said, you know, that stigma is still, is still a huge um, problem. You know, I don't want to reel off a load of stats, but you know, uh, there was a recent report that it it was something like 80% of people in the workplace would not feel comfortable talking to a manager about mental health issues. Uh, versus about 30% that would not feel comfortable talking to family or friends. So that 30% is still very high. 30% of people that won't talk to their families or friends, but compare that to the 80%, you know, as soon as you cross that threshold or now that virtual threshold into the office, um, suddenly, you know, your guard is up and you can't talk about these things. And I think on the other side of that, we also have to be a little bit careful because, um, uh, we have to be careful not to make things like burnout and imposter syndrome this um, kind of badge of honor. And I think there is the risk of that, you know, because, because, you know, a lot of podcasts and things like this, you know, we, you, you get people in um, what seems like a successful position from the outside, talking about these specific issues. And then it kind of becomes this, okay, so like, to be successful, you have to have been burnt out, and you have to have uh, experienced imposter syndrome. So I think there's also a sense of caution we have to have that we don't kind of um, make this, um, you know, we don't glamorize uh, those issues in a way. Um, it doesn't matter who you are, what position you're in, uh, um, you know, how much money you earn, you can experience um, these issues. And we're losing you a little bit. Ah. Yeah. Okay, you're back now. Yeah, yeah. You know, we lost I finished and I was waiting for somebody to say something. So I don't know how much of that you got. <laughs> All right. No, I mean, it, I think it was the last two sentences. And I okay. thought it, something really important came and we're like, it's coming now. <laughs> don't worry. I rarely say important <laughs> you, things. You get so. the point. You, <laughs> get the, uh, you got the point across there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, totally. Like plus one on, on what you said. Um, and now I'm wondering how it was in, in your case, because you mentioned like, uh, of course, like through the through founding, um, through co-founding with Levi, and before you already had the awareness and you already seen like the importance of vulnerability, showing vulnerability in a leadership position. Um, did you find yourself in a similar situation as Javi? How, uh, how did you approach it? And like being um, in a leadership position, being part of the leadership team in several companies, did you find it um, difficult to open up or, um, were you already in that mindset that we just mentioned uh, back then and that it was a bit easier for you? Yeah, good question. Maybe you can answer this better than me, Nasir, actually, because you are working in the marketing team. Um, She's still at, a type four. Is that why? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you left. <laughs> Maybe as an observer, you would be uh, better answering this question, but I'll tell you from my perspective. Um, so I consider myself to be quite um, 
well, very liberal, uh, progressive. You know, I've, I've never really been afraid of talking about things in general, but then there's a limit to that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I definitely found myself holding things back and I definitely didn't find myself going to work and, you know, letting go of all of my problems and, and being completely honest about the way that I was feeling at particular, particular moments. Um, and, and look, I used to have good conversations with people about these topics. And that's why, again, we have to be a little bit careful because I have plenty of conversations about the importance of talking about these things. I talked more about the importance of talking about these things than I did actually talking about these things, you know? So it's, it's easy to kind of talk about how important it is to talk about, um, you know, your struggles and your imposter syndrome and all of this kind of stuff, but it's not so easy when, when it's crunch time and you have to actually talk, talk about those things that are personal to you. Cause uh, I think both Alex and Javi mentioned this, you know, you, you, you risk, you're, you're creating a bit of, bit of risk. Like how is this going to be perceived? Yes. In the moment I'm going to be perceived as authentic and a real person. Great. But then uh, am I going to be looked at as weak later on? Am I going to have um, fewer opportunities come my way later on because I'm seen as a less stable person to be doing this job? Um, if I admit that I feel like, you know, in my position as a VP of marketing, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. Like, how did I get here? This is, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. I feel like a, you know, a 16 year old boy still like, um, you know, if you if you start admitting those things, what in the moment, of course, you feel like people are going to say the right thing, but what actually happens? But I think you start to realize the more you do talk about those things, actually, uh, you know, people do value that because for a very simple reason, most of us, um, you know, a good chunk of us have gone through something similar. So if somebody tells you something and you can relate to that, it's very unlikely that you're going to hold it against them. You know, you will, you will probably admire them more for, for sharing that because you can connect to it. So I think that's an important thing to remember. You know, when you're sharing this, you're not just sharing something that you've gone through, you're probably sharing something that the other person can connect to um, as well. And you'll see that actually it doesn't hurt too much to, to share it. I'm going to go off the beaten path here and going to do something unorthodox, which is ask a question to the co-host. So that's yeah, what's your point of view on this? And more as an employee, right? Because uh, we know these two guys have already have done their research and maybe they experienced more like their pressure of being co-founders, uh, founders of companies or, or leaders of, of big teams. And But from the employee perception, uh, would, is that something you would talk to your the, the people you report to or to your peers, um, how you do it, how you deal with it? Uh, yes, I'm completely honest. Like, even though I support like this movement or this mentality of um, allowing for vulnerability, making it um, more stigma free, um, I must admit, I'm also, I'm more on the side um, where it would cost me a lot of um, effort and uh, courage to actually, um, address, if I had like a similar issue to, to go to my manager or to, um, admitted openly in, in, in my workplace. I was in a, um, I was in similar situations. So with imposter syndrome, yes, absolutely. I still have it. Like I've been um, a tad from for like two and a half years now. And sometimes I still have like the impression somebody's gonna come through the door and be like, actually, what are you doing here? Like, we, we hired you by mistake. <laughs> but I think, I don't know, like, I think it's a, uh, you, you see like once everybody starts talking about it, you realize it's more common than you think. And you realize like, it's not only you. Um, but I also was in a position um, and not here at Tantrum, but in my previous job, where I actually realized I was just, I was, it was a mixture of, I was unhappy, I was frustrated, um, because I was not, because that was not my dream job, and because the environment where I worked was not, um, was not, like, there was not a big overlap uh, with the way I would like to work, or like my mm, values, I guess, but then also the, in terms of quantity, the, the amount of work, um, but because I, I was in this mentality of, like I shouldn't show any weaknesses and no, I, have to, I just have to power through it and I need to prove um, that, I, that I can perform and I need to prove I need to prove that. Um, there were phases when I was just going home and I just didn't have energy, like neither physically nor mental, en uh, mental energy to do anything anymore. And it also, in there I realized like how, um, that I needed to change something. And in my case, it was um, look for a new job and change companies. But there I realized how dangerous this can be because uh, I, I don't know, it feels a bit like this issue sucks out the life out of you because you also don't have the joy of uh, the joy for the other things that are outside of your work life anymore. So um, even though I was not like, I was never a co-founder, I was never in a, in a leadership position like you guys, but uh, from an employee perspective, I, um, 
I kind of like I, I've experienced something similar and I've seen the danger of um, how fast it can make you unhappy if you um, if you do anything about it. And in my case, like I didn't talk about um, it in that environment and in that um, company where I was, but um, I was talking to to my sisters a lot. I was talking with friends and that um, even though they're not a professional um, therapist, but just the act of like talking to somebody about it, um, it definitely it definitely helped me. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to go back to uh, the questions from the audience because uh, there's quite a remarkable amount of really high profile people listening to us today, including your former investors from Target Global, Javi, uh, your co-founder, Avi Mayer, who actually sends a really good question. So this question comes from Avi, which is he wants to know more about the business. Before that, he wants to know what about your haircut and whether you're going to head bank online. I'll let you answer that or not. Um, the question is, Traditional therapies rely on repeatability, right? It's more about having people coming over and over and, you know, they might solve the problem, but they rely on having the people just uh, continuous clients, like clients continuing over time rather than having new clients, right? How are you dealing with this? Like, what's the what's the fine line between continuing with the, with the clients, but solving the problem and having them move on and therefore lose customers, Right. Well, look, and, and it's a great question. Thanks, Avi. <laughs> so we um, we actually don't get involved in the actual therapy. That's completely decided by the customer and the therapist, and they go for as long as they think they need. Our job is just to get to that person, get that person to the objectives that they want, and that's up to the therapist to to manage in the best way that they see fit. So we don't try to retain uh, people longer than they should, or or vice versa. We simply say, hey we've made sure that you get the absolutely best therapist for you and for your needs. Then from the moment that we match you with that person, it's up to you and the therapist to decide how long you should attend this. So uh, um, that's how we, how we go around this. Because uh, uh, Lena doubles down on that, like, uh, and, and she says that, you know, how, okay, you have to say that you don't get involved in this, but however, you're becoming a platform, right? You're becoming a call it or not, maybe it's a marketplace, maybe it's not a marketplace, but you're matching people, you're changing the model, right? And by changing the model, you're making it more widely accessible and open to a bigger audience. So maybe, uh, how do you think the market will react to that? Do you think there will be people just trying to uh, keep in the old ways of doing it? And so like, no, I'm not joining this platform because this is bad for the, for the industry. Or do you think they're going to switch sides and join you? Uh, guys on the platform well i mean essentially we're not all we're doing is making it a lot easier for these people to get care there i mean what are their options their option is a try to navigate the internet and find the best person based on a picture that you might like or maybe a few terms that you connect with but you have no idea anything else about that person so you take a massive risk so we're not really changing anything we're just making it a lot easier and reducing the stress of you having to think who is the best therapist for me, right? There's a, there's a very there's a very clear reason why we're not building it just a marketplace where you can go and have to, which is, which is the same thing like Google, right? You go to these marketplaces, you have hundreds of practitioners and it's up to you to pick one, but I have no idea what I need or who's the best fit for me. Why am I doing this? I need somebody that with the knowledge about me and the other individual to make this match for it to be meaningful or else you basically left on your own like in the past. So we're, we're actually reducing as much as we can the friction to find the right care for you, but not really changing a scientifically and, and evidence-based therapy methods. That's completely up for the therapist, right? We don't want to change that. That's already been proven and it works. We just want to make it a lot easier to get to that. And how about, because. Lena is asking really good questions related to the business part of it. So if you're a marketplace, it will happen or it might happen like the Airbnb effect, right? Which is people will try to circumvent the market, uh, the marketplace because they will get a lower price perhaps, right? They know they lose the warranty. That's what it happens. And therefore they will not be able to claim anything and whatever, but people still fucking do it because it's cheaper, right? And it's more convenient. And, and the marketplaces tend to be super protective than they, they try to, you know, blur out all the email addresses, any kind of contact details. They censor you in the chat. They give you warnings. The more protective they, they, they are, then 
the more people feel like they should circumvent it and just do business all the same because it's a, you build a relationship with your therapies and then eventually their stress is like, fuck the marketplace, I don't need this anymore. How do you envision this will pan out in your company? Yeah, it's a great question. So look, um, the good thing about this is that these people, the last thing they want to do is do business and marketing. So there, it's not like they're business people. They're trying to find how to make more money in, in cheeky ways. If they do that once, you know, we'll catch up to it pretty quick. And then we just terminate the relationship. That was that. They get no more new customers. They get no more invoicing tools. They get no more, you know, payment tools and all this stuff. So we talked extensively with our therapist about this when we were thinking about this business. And they just don't see the benefit in stealing one, two, three clients because they're, become, they're a psychologist for the next 20 years. So they will need customers for the next 20 years. They will need to do payments and invoicing for the next 20 years, marketing for the next one. They don't want to do that. So they see no real value in trying to go around us for one or two customers because it brings them nothing. But um, you're right about this, but there's one thing that happens which the problem comes at scale, right? At the very beginning, you will be, yeah, but I'm giving you that. You will be super patronizing with the, with the people in your marketplace because obviously all the added value is on your side. But as these kind of marketplaces or platforms scale, thinking of Amazon, thinking of Uber, thinking of Airbnb, they come to a point in which they don't need those many people on the platform anymore. Therefore, they change the policies, they change the pricing, they change this and that. They start giving that five-star or seven-star um, support to the people on the platform because they're having so many options now, right? So this balance between not having enough people, therefore caring a lot about them, which is the stage at you, where you're at, and Airbnb or Uber, which is like literally, we just don't care anymore and we're just going to drive down the tips or the prices, whatever. And that's why all of this... Econ gig economy uh, platforms have uh, some sort of flow over there is that precisely they, they don't care that much about the people. I'm not saying this is your case because yours looks more of a high end of the spectrum in the kind of things that you can acquire there. One thing is taxi rights, but the other is like therapies. Like this is fucking serious, right? Like it's your brain. You only got one brain. It's a better treat, right? So, but do you think this, this problem will come at scale and how do you plan to solve it? Look, um, we'll cross the bridge when, when we get to that scale. Uh, for now, and um, we truly yeah. think that there's enough value that we can give to these people through the journey of this process, right? It doesn't end just by making the match and giving the client. There's technology you can give to these practitioners and to the customers to make, for example, in-between session care really easy, right? And, and therapists will never come up with this. Or for example, you can create a library of resources where these therapists can have access and simply send that to the customers today, they have to create these resources on their own. So the great thing about us is that the value doesn't stop at the moment that we make a referral. You know, they're still completely under our technology and they're using our resources to make sure that the therapy goes as smooth as possible. For now, uh, we really see no indication of how they would circumvent around that value to make a few much a few more bucks, right? And I don't think it's very comparable to these other marketplaces where the value really dies once you've made that connection with those two people, right? The supplier and the demand. And in our case, the, the, the journey is much longer and there's a lot more taking place during months. So, um, so to be honest, it's, it's not really a concern that we have and that we're seeing. Uh, okay. But I'm happy to talk with Sorry. this with Lina and Avi in detail. They have my WhatsApp. They can reach out whenever they want and we'll go into detail. And they, they can invest whenever they want, right? <laughs> you know how to make them money. That's, that's a good backdrop. Uh, Sancha, I just had a quick marketing question to you. Um, I assume you are the one um, leading the marketing efforts around um, Oliva. Given that it's, given that it's um, such an interesting product and also new in its kind, um, what, what, was your, what was the initial strategy that you... Um, how you thought about uh, marketing uh, this product and how it's going so far? Yeah, um, so yes, to answer your first question, um, so I'm leading the marketing effort. But essentially what that means is uh, tapping into the demand and doing that in sensible ways and, you know, with the usual looking after your unit economics and all of that kind of boring stuff. What I find much more exciting is the opportunities on the brand side. So we've talked about stigma a lot. Um, I really admire brands that 
uh, bravely try and break down stigma. So Jurex has done it for sex. Uh, Bodyform has done it for women's health and, and periods. Um, you know, there are plenty of these brands that are really bravely kind of going out there, putting taboo subjects um, right in people's faces, talking about it. And the best way to break a taboo is to is to just talk about it, to expose it, right? And this is where I think um, we have an amazing opportunity with Oliva, just to be bold and unapologetic about talking about mental health. Um, but not from the usual point of view that, in my opinion, a lot of um, brands do it. So a lot of brands do it from the, uh, I don't want to badmouth other brands, but like this is this is a personal opinion that a lot of brands do it from the point of view that they are the ultimate holders of truth in terms of what happiness is. And you see all of these like inspirational quotes with, you know, backgrounds of um, people running along a beach and, you know, some clouds hovering over a mountain or something. And, you know, on a daily basis, we're being told in little bite-sized quotes, how to be happy. Uh, I don't think that's what a brand should do in this space. I think a brand should should be on the same level as the as the audience, should learn with the audience, should be relatable for that audience and, and be uh, authentic as well. We talked about this in leadership, but I think it's important in brands as well. So this is for me what I think the, the exciting opportunity here is to actually start chipping away at the um, taboo. I'm not saying we're gonna do it alone. Uh, I don't think many movements are done alone um but we would love to be a part of that and um if if we can play a small part in breaking down the stigma around talking about mental health then that in my opinion is a very successful marketing strategy i could talk about all of the kind of more boring stuff but i don't think in the next three minutes that's what everybody wants to hear about <laughs> no, no that, that that's that's really good and i just wanted to to give a quick shout out to all the friends and colleagues that you guys have that are not only online and watching, sending questions, but are bombarding me on WhatsApp. It's like, hey, yeah, like I, I know them. And I can you ask them this question? I think this is the first time this happens, like getting a real-time question on WhatsApp. And uh, so it's it's so great. That speaks at length about the trust you've built with the people around you. And that I'm pretty sure that you're going to be successful in trying to change the games of this, in, in the, the rules of the game in this industry. Last question, you know, we always ask a weird question at the end but i think this time i'm just gonna twitch it a little bit because it comes with a message right usually we ask for the useless superpower it's our brand we know hobbies um we don't know yours but i think we're touching on so many complicated issues here and one other question that we've got to start brand is that what's your biggest fuck up right and whether you can quantify it i'm gonna tweak it to saying if you guys can share your biggest fuck up and how did you open up about it? It's, it's, quite, it's quite funny because I uh, I got a message from a friend just before the event saying, good luck with Startup Grind. Don't forget to prepare for the question at the end about your biggest superpower. <laughs> we're going to tweet about it. Like, we're going to ask you on Twitter. Don't worry. <laughs> My answer was going to be, well, I don't have one. Um, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. So it's like being super humble, right? <laughs> no, but like, honestly, but to be completely, I'm not trying to, you know, shit on your questions or anything, but like, I, okay, so who you has prepared. superpowers? I mean, nobody has superpowers, prepared. right? Uh, we're, yeah. we're, we're all just, and I know that sounds like a super, like, cheesy thing to say, but. But honestly, like I. No, but our our question is useless superpower, not what is your superpower. It's a useless, useless superpower. superpower. Okay, I didn't know that. All right, okay. I was preparing for the wrong thing. Anyways, now you go and share it. Like, let's see if you got one useless superpower. We know Javi's, but we don't know yours. And then we go into the fuck ups. Two extra minutes. Uh yeah. So I didn't prepare for that question. Um. No worries. Nobody prepares. That's the thing about <laughs> Sarah. No preparation. Even though I had a WhatsApp beforehand. Um. <laughs> Yeah, look, uh, I don't know. I I, I can tell um, terrible jokes um, to break the ice. I'm I'm a bit of an introvert, and I um, you know I I struggle to break into conversation. I think I'm okay once it's going, but I struggle to kind of break it straight away. So I've got a few uh, bad jokes up my sleeve for those situations. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll we'll let that. We'll accept that one. Okay, now <laughs> we'll for the super. I uh, like sorry the super fuck up. And how did you open up about it? How did you share it with the team? How did you deal with it? And was it something that affected you? How did you have one? Yeah. Perfect. One minute each. Just let's do it. Ah, first. You start. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I don't know if I have, like, I have loads of fuck ups uh, rather than just one big one. Um, but look, I mean, you know, at, at Typeform, like, I was just constantly making mistakes, hired too many people, uh, spent too much money. Um, you know, sold, sold an idea that was the wrong idea to sell. I don't know. 
loads of stuff like that in my in my kind of uh, professional life i guess you know i've just made loads and loads of mistakes i once actually when i started at hotjar i created this slide and kind of showed you know how like in one chart how many mistakes i've made and versus how many mistakes uh, how many things i got right but also like how that leads to the learnings i learned the most from the mistakes so yeah lo like a long long list of mistakes uh, in in my professional life but yeah i mean it helped help me learn in the end i know that's a really crappy answer <laughs> no but it's good because you're you're making it more accessible as in starting in a new job sharing your previous jobs fuck ups it's pretty impressive like you, know I mean? you would earn my respect right away all right, we'll leave it at that then. That's perfect. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> Abby, you want to go with yours? Yeah, for me, I think, you know, my biggest fuck up was to let others instill insecurities into my mind and me believing this thing, right? I should have completely believed in myself instead of those insecurities that were instilled. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that was probably the biggest fuck up because that had a lot of repercussions in, in the actions I took, in, in how I made decisions, right? Double guessing, stuff like that. I wish I would have stood up for myself a bit more and just believed in myself a bit more. And I think I think that was probably my biggest fuck up. Sanjar, uh, there's somebody on YouTube by the name of Snoopy. I don't know who that is. It's, it's, hell yeah, Sanjar. So it's probably somebody who knows you really well and can assess to what you said. So <laughs> it must be their gangster name. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nasia being a Kikas co-host. We did no preparation with her. I mean, you couldn't tell, but we literally, I told her, just be online and you're going to be in the conversation. You'll help me out. And that's all we prepared. <laughs> Thank you, Kavi. Thank you, Sanjar. We look forward to hearing more about Oliva. And because um, I think this is going to be very helpful. I don't know if you gained new clients <laughs> tonight. You definitely got a new a lot of new people just checking your website right now um in one minute one thing they should know i'm just rolling the carpet for you there you've got this camera you've got still uh about 50 people left on on youtube so what's this one thing they should know about oliva for people who have left you know fuck them they they're missing out <laughs> like uh, now you're giving the extra bonus content what should they know just give it a go. Think of it like going to the gym, right? You don't just go to the gym because you want to lose 20 stone. You go to the gym because you want to keep your heart healthy. You want to feel good. You want to be more productive. Um, therapy doesn't have to be any different. And uh, Oliva, we believe, is a is a good place to get started with that with that mentality. So give last it a go. words, Javi, last words. Part That's it. Words. I think just don't Perfect. overthink it. We all have it. Uh, uh, we're trying to make it easy for you. Just, just try it. Just give it a go, right? Uh, there's nothing to lose. And... Uh, I think I think that's spot on. Yeah, when you said uh, just think as like the gym, I said most dude, most people they sign up for the gym, they never go. That's that's literally not what you want to have here, unless they pay, right? I mean, if they're paid, they don't go. That's perfect for you. Like marketing efforts, <laughs> perfect. All right, thank you very much, everybody. I think we can wrap you up here. Um, thank you for being part of Star Prime and for answering our call. And we'll see you well next year. Actually, this was the last event of the year. We'll do a proper recap in January. I think we'll do something special. I'm just talking out of my ass right now. We don't have anything planned, but we'll probably do something special in January because we need to cheer people up. 2021, it's got to be the year for everybody. Keep grinding. Thanks, Bye, man. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everybody.